Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening's talk is given by Alice Lim, who started her training at the Courtauld. And the talk this evening, she started researching it as part of her thesis, I think, at the Courtauld. But since then, she's continued to work on it. And she's been to Saal, and she is now an advanced graduate at the Hamilton Car. So, Alice, over to you. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Claire, for the introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, so, yes, as Claire said, the research I'll be presenting tonight was initially begun as part of my thesis for my postgraduate diploma at the Courtauld. Um, so I'm going to begin with, sorry, this is not changing, Ooh. sorry, one second, I'm just going to reshare the screen. Um, apologies. Sometimes, sometimes it's sticky. Yeah, I think it is at the moment. Um, okay. Hopefully, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, technical issues aside. Um, I'm going to begin with a brief overview of the group of sketches that I worked on, but um, just quickly, I'll run you through the sort of outline. So I'm going to begin with the reason for why they were created. Um, take you through a very quick study of their materials and techniques, and finally turn to their conservation histories, their collection, and later their display. Um, for that section, I'm going to focus particularly on three works that are oil sketches on paper. So um, the group that I brought together to study um, consisted of primarily head or bust format images of characterful and often elderly male sitters. Artists represented included Annibale Caracci, two of his students, Guaccino and Domenichino, as well as several works by unnamed artists which have been curatorially associated with the Bolognese school. I won't be focusing on attribution here, although dating will be mentioned very briefly in relation to one work. So my initial research at the Courtauld involved comparative analysis of these paintings, as well as looking into their conservation histories. The initial research was heavily focused on technical analysis. I really wanted to understand the materials and methods of the artists and how these might differ between sketches executed on different supports. We have canvas and paper in the study. Before we get into the technical findings, I think it's very important to consider why these works were made. Linking type to function enables us to elucidate categories that are specific to, and therefore more useful for, describing the many possible functions of an oil sketch. Four main categories of intended function are proposed and used here. So as practice pieces for the artist's own development, as preparatory explorations into composition and or foreshortening as character studies done from life, intended as types to use as a kind of artistic stock. And finally, a copy, usually of another work. Further functionality would inevitably be added as the original artist, students, copyists, and later collectors viewed and used these works in their own ways. We can't ignore the Counter-Reformation while discussing late 16th and early 17th century Italian art. In the final session of the Council of Trent, Cardinal Pagliotti, who was Archbishop of Bologna, was tasked with defining the purposes, uses, and decorum appropriate for religious art. Painting had to be made, sorry, had to make religious revelation clear to all members of society, with an artist's virtuosity subservient to the requirements of the religious miracle being depicted. While no specific style or mode would be prescribed, Religious art had to evoke emotional and empathetic responses from both educated and illiterate viewers. The artistic environment that the Karachi would enter some 20 years after the council was therefore one preoccupied both with historical precedent and with the pursuit of naturalistic effect. Against this backdrop, we must note some broader trends in artistic organization. The Karachi's Accademia degli Incaminati was founded in 1586. This wasn't the first environment intended to educate and train artists. Similar institutions had existed in Florence and in Rome previously. However, the Caracci's academia differed from these by also functioning as the family's own workshop, especially that of the elder cousin Ludovico Caracci. He remained mostly in Bologna 
The foundation of these early academies would shift how art is trained, no longer apprentice style under a single master, but instead learning together from several masters as well as each other. This would have profound implication for the organization of artistic training, as well as the development of art theory and its taste in following centuries. Indeed, the 18th century English environment in which these sketches would eventually be collected would not have been possible without this legacy, as Sir Joshua Reynolds made clear in his famous discourses. Within their academia, the Karachi aimed to synthesize traits of the major schools of Italian painting, while integrate sorry, while integrating recent discoveries of classical antiquity, as well as developments in art theory. This was all set against a practice of working from life, from cadavers, as well as antique casts. The Accademia degli Incaminati was notable for its strong tradition of drawing and painting from life. And it was contemporaneously said of the Karachi that they ate and drew at the same time with bread in one hand and chalk or charcoal in the other. Everything and every one that they saw was subject to study. So numerous, numerous drawings showing members of the academy at work in the life school attest. Their practice of working from the live model in combination with the counter-reformation counter impetus for emotional impact resulted in these, the realistic, pensive, and at times revelatory sketches of characterful sitters. It's also led to the Karachi being perjured, unfairly in my opinion, as eclectics due to their hybridized style and varied technique. All but one of these works are believed to have been created within the immediate orbit of the Karachi school. The active encouragement of drawing and painting from life within this environment lends weight to the idea that all of these were created with artistic development and or improvement partly in mind. However, the idea of these sketches as early as only practice is somewhat belied by their very competent execution. I haven't found many pentimenti and the efficient and rapid buildup of layers across the group indicates a certain sureness of hand. The survival rate for practice or sort of less well executed works is known to be very poor in drawings and is probably quite similar here. When talking about drawing in traditional media, the art historian Gail Feigenbaum has demonstrated mental gymnastics required for a sketch to be considered worth keeping. It needed to be elevated from artifact to art, having been begun solely with the aim of artistic development. A very similar process was necessary in the context of a painted oil sketch. And we therefore find that the surviving paintings are probably skewed towards greater competency than was necessarily the case while they were created. Only the most useful examples would be retained. Despite this somewhat bleak picture, there are actually plenty of excellent oil sketches out there, and they appear fairly regularly at auction and in other places. I'd really like to take a moment here to thank everyone who's called similar examples to my attention over the years. And please continue to do so also. Um, so this work, the reclining nude that you see in the center has very complicated foreshortening and is set in a specific, albeit idealized landscape, thereby making it more an example of compositional working out in preparation for a specific commission than that of a generalized stock figure. In this way, it can in some respects be compared to the Modelli sketches painted by Rubens after his return from Italy in the early 17th century. No finished work featuring this reclining nude has yet been identified in Karachi's oeuvre. Although of course, this doesn't mean that the oil sketch may not have been made for a commission that was later aborted or destroyed. Alongside practice, another reason to paint sketches in oil was to build up a repertoire or a library of stock characters or types, which were of great use in the studio setting. These weren't necessarily intended to serve as preparation for a specific commission, but the Counter-Reformation had made it imperative for artists to replicate believable emotions from realistic figures within these finished works. Oil sketches could serve as a route towards this, enabling artists to explore expression, emotion, and also pose. And the sketches themselves often blur the lines between these categories of artistic practice and the requirement of later commission. They are, in this way, artistic stock ready to be called up from the portfolio when required. Poses and facial expressions often evoke religious revelation or deep thought, and angles of depiction are general enough for use across the right range of commissions. The sitters are often viewed from slightly above or below, useful when depicting like old pieces or similar, and moody lighting conditions suited to somber or serious religious subjects do prevail. The anonymized sitters, mostly these old men or women with impressively flowing beards and hair, obviously only in the case of the men, 
are lent well to a whole variety of religious themes, be they hermit saints, clergymen, or early church martyrs. Indeed, the head of an old man that you see at the centre here has historically been entitled head of a saint. Similar works produced by Rembrandt and artists such as Van Yeven in the 1630s in the Northern context have been referred to as trony. These are portraits of a type rather than of an individual. Domenichino's three studies of the head of an old man has historically been seen as a preparatory work for his altarpiece of St. Jerome. Although the fact that this sitter's head was recycled into the altarpiece at a slightly different pose and in a different angle means that the sketch here functions more as an example of this artistic stock to be drawn on rather than what we traditionally think of a preparatory work of the exact composition. It can certainly be argued that most of the sketches included in my study straddle these categories of character stock and developmental practice. As will be demonstrated later, the materials and techniques used enhance the view that they were created with the intention of their use being largely within the studio context. However, there are several instances within this group where the likeness is more specific than these generalized types, and thereby the sketch is likely intended as preparation for a specific commission, usually, as you see in these cases, a portrait. Costume and pose are common signifiers of this. For example, the head of a bishop on the left is identified as such by the hat and mitre worn, while these other three sitters are shown with neutral expressions and in poses more conventionally suited for formal portraiture. The final category I'll discuss here is that of the copy. Saltrim House, which is in Devon's, head of a bearded old man, is believed to have been copied after another work towards the end of the 17th or, more likely, in the 18th or early 19th century. This conclusion was reached due to a combination of slightly unusual technique. The typical Bolognese layering of midtones and highlights is inverted in this painting relative to others I looked at, and also to, due to the discovery of lead tin antimonate or Naples yellow. This is a painting that doesn't appear frequently in use until the end of the 17th century, but had a real heyday during the 18th and early 19th centuries. As we'll see later, the collection of these objects during this later period gives a clear motive for creating such a copy. They could be bought and sold for good money. So I'm now going to talk briefly about the materials and techniques used before moving on to collection and then conservation histories. Let's begin with paintings using canvas as their primary supports, which are all on slide now. All of these have been executed on tabby weave canvas, which appears to have been the dominant choice for Bolognese painting of this period. And while the texture of these canvases does vary across the group, I think it's really important to note the prevalence of rough weaves. The ready-made texture that a rougher weave imparts appears to have been desirable in the context of these less highly finished sketches. Reasons for this are twofold. Firstly, a canvas with more texture in the, beard, in the weave is very favourable to the execution of thick impasto, which is a very notable feature of the craggy flesh and long beards and hair of these sitters. Secondly, a rougher weave canvas is much quicker and therefore cheaper to produce. Evidence for canvas pricing in this period in Bologna is quite sparse. The majority of textile production appears to have taken place within the home, although there were attempts to stimulate a more formal Bolognese weaving industry made largely by the church in the second half of the 15th century and quite unsuccessfully. However, textiles are fairly easy to transport and given Bologna's location along well-established trading routes during the early modern period, it's highly likely that canvases used by Bolognese artists were manufactured elsewhere, transported to Bologna and then bought and used locally. Price is very important when we consider that these works were intended mostly for use within the artist's studio and were not, on the whole, made to be sold, although obviously their creation would contribute to the larger business of making and then selling art. A sketch's quality would therefore not be stipulated by a patron, and it's understandable that artists may have sought to cut costs wherever possible when compiling types or practicing elements for their own use in the studio. The interpretation of cost as a factor behind the choice of support is also upheld by the fact that two of these paintings have underlying compositions. Reuse varies to a greater or lesser degree. X-rays of both of these works show alternative compositions beneath the surface. So this head of a man has an unfinished version of the same sitter beneath the current composition. This earlier composition had the sitter shown slightly more side on, He's presented more frontally now, and the dominant light source is now from the left. 
In the upper version of the composition, so what we see, the sitter has been moved up slightly and a lower ear is visible through cracks within the green background. Flesh paint from the lower composition is also visible through cracks in the hair. And brittle age cracking is extremely evident in the forehead due to the much thicker layers of very well dried lead white present here. Domenichino's three studies has likewise been worked over a previous composition, although this isn't a pentimento type change like we've just seen, but instead is a complete reuse of the canvas for an entirely new work or three new works. The underlying composition is much more evident at the surface than in the previous example. So this earlier composition was a portrait, you can see it on the right, in vertical format, meaning that the canvas was then rotated 90 degrees before reuse. The sitter here appears relatively youthful and to me seems quite androgynous, although I'd really welcome, again, any thoughts on the gender. Aspects of the portrait are visible at the surface, notably the white cuffs of the sitter's costume, which are quite obvious at the forehead of the left-hand head. The top of the sitter's forehead and hair also make an appearance at the far right of the painting. So a catalogue produced in 1967 for the Christchurch Gallery picture collection, which is where this work is from, wrongly states that the red areas between these heads and to the left edge are also part of the underlying composition, assuming that they relate to the bodice and the skirt of the sitter, who the catalogue assume is female. However, these areas of red are not the costume. In fact, they cover brushstrokes which do relate to the costume, particularly in the neckline, as you can see at the right. I'd like to suggest that these areas of red were therefore intended either as a ground type colour or else were applied to block out disturbing elements of the lower composition. Efforts were certainly made to reduce the impact of the portrait, firstly by rotating the canvas and also by applying a beige buff colour over the portrait, particularly in areas like the sitter's hair and over the stark white cuffs. Within the group that I brought together for study, six oil sketches were executed on laid paper. All have since been mounted onto another support, canvas, panel, or in some cases, a millboard. There are many reasons why late 16th and early 17th century Bolognese artists might have chosen paper for their oil sketches, and several lend further weight to the interpretation of intended function that I've set out previously. The choice of paper supports for some of these group may be a natural consequence of the oil sketches intermediary position between the arts of drawing and that of painting. Nonetheless, for Bolognese work, the university and the associated paper making industry's presence must be considered, considered a relevant factor for this material choice. Paper was both abundant and quite cheap in Bologna during this period. Its quality was also strictly controlled with production standards enforced by the Paper Makers Guild, and apologies for my pronunciation of this, or the Societa degli Speciali. The presence of the university, a major consumer of paper during the early modern period, and the associated printing industry drove production. By 1389, the guilds had standardized, creating this on the right, the Bologna stone. This set out four different sizes, which are the ancestors of modern paper sizes today. In descending order, these are known as Imperiale, Reale, Mezzana, and Risuta. And I think that this standard not only indicates the volumes that were being produced by the paper industry, but also show the needs of the burgeoning printing industry to have papers of known size. The Karachi would come into frequent contact with major players in the Bolognese paper and also printing industry, particularly Agostino, so the kind of middle Karachi, worked closely with the printmaker Domenico Tobaldi, engraving paintings for him for print reproduction. Their relationship was so close that on Tobaldi's death in 1583, just a couple of years before the foundation of the Karachi's Academy, Agostino was the recipient of the Impressori's printing press and his content, studio contents, including large sheaves of paper. This close connection with the printing industry at the very heart of the Karachi's Academy not only enforces the role of copies and reproductions within this academy, but it also explains the abundant use of paper for drawing and increases the likelihood that paper as a support for painting was either actively encouraged or at the very least, extremely readily available. Hand making paper obviously results in a certain amount of variation between individual sheets, but these oil sketches do not correspond to these standardized dimensions in a straightforward manner, if only it was this easy. Only one work, 
the head of a bishop, which you see on screen here, can plausibly be argued as approximately half the dimension of a Bolognese imperiale sheet, or else that of roughly a full mezzana. The irregular sizes and size ratios of the other works on paper don't encourage comparison with Bolognese standards. Indeed, most of the sketches in this group appear to have been executed on cut down or irregularly shaped papers, which may also explain why I didn't find any watermarks across the group. Reuse of paper, we know, is very common in the drawing context. I'm sure we've all seen those images of, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbooks, etc., with lots of different drawings on one sheet. It also appears to have been the case in one instance that I came across within my group. So this is Anibale Karachi's Head of an Old Woman at the left. This is painted on a page which was removed from a ledger. And the text is left visible in the final image. I think it's actually a shopping list, which is quite fun. Um, other examples of sketches by Anibale on reused paper do also exist. So the work you see on the right was sold at Christie's recently. And I actually believe, although it's quite hard to prove, having not been able to examine it further, that that sheet may be from the same ledger as the head of an old woman. Examining the head of an old man in profile to the left revealed two creases created in the paper when the still wet sheet was hung over a rope, or in this case, two ropes, to dry. These indentations are very visible, both in raking light and in an X-ray, as the lead containing in premature layer has collected in the indentations left by the rope. The presence of this fold line was often viewed as a surface defect by artists. When Leonardo da Vinci bought Bolognese paper for cartoons in 1504, his contract made specific reference to, and again, apologies for the pronunciation of this, apianatura, which is the process for flattening spines caused by the drying ropes. This incurred an extra fee from the stationer who sold the paper. So the presence of such obvious creases in the context of this particular oil sketch may indicate a reluctance to pay extra for processing, lending further weight to the interpretation that these sketches were often painted on cheaper papers. While some aesthetic aspects of paper were not favored by artists, other characteristics of the material were used and exploited. Laid paper has two differently textured sides. Firstly, the laid side, which holds the impressions from the chains and the would also show a watermark. And then the felted side, which is where you turn it out onto a sheet of felt, um, and it results in a more uniform texture. Anibale Karachi appears to have had a real preference for working on the more heavily textured laid side. His reclining nude, the head of an old woman, and the, this anonymous head of a bishop, which I'm not suggesting is by him, but it's interesting that it also features this, are all executed on the laid side. No compositions were detected on the versos of any of these works using either IR or X-ray, which indicates that the use of the laid side is most likely due to artistic preference for a rougher surface, possibly quite similar to the textured canvases that we've already seen. Moving away from supports, I think it's quite important to widen our conception of what can be considered a ground. I'm going to use ground um, here to refer to an oil bound colored layer, which is applied across the entire surface of the painting prior to the execution of the composition. Works on paper don't, at least in the context of my study, have a preparatory oil layer of comparative thickness or opaqueness to a ground, but they have usually, and in this case all, been prepared with colored surfaces to paint on. So just quickly to visit the canvases, the standard preparation for these in terms of their ground is a brownish red oil bound ground applied across the surface and consisting mostly or usually of iron oxide earth pigments, lead white and then carbon black in varying proportions. There are also inclusions found such as ground glass or gypsum usually present as extenders or else to improve the working properties of this paint layer. The intensity of colour and the relative red or brownness varies from artist to artist. So this example had by far the reddest of any of the grounds of the works on canvas that I examined. Elemental analysis showed that this intense red was not due to vermilion or something else, but is in fact an iron oxide earth pigment. And I did find that brightly coloured iron oxide pigments of various shades, both in grounds and as we'll see later in the paint layers, are a real hallmark of this group. This is likely due to the extensive selection of earths available locally. Bologna is known in Italy as La Citta Rossa, the red city, due to its characteristic red stone. It also lies near to major sources of green earth, 
notably Verona, and it also lay on the intersection of major early modern trade routes. As mentioned earlier, Domenichino's three studies was worked over an earlier portrait composition. Areas of bright red, which again are an iron oxide, not a vermilion as you might think, are used as a half tone in parts of the painting, albeit an incredibly bright one, somewhat similarly to how ground colours are used elsewhere within this group of sketches. The ground layer of the portrait beneath the three studies is by contrast beige brown and has relatively few red pigment particles. The ground of this oil sketch is perhaps the truest red brown ground here. It's also one of the most varied in composition. You can see these extremely large lead white and then orange or red iron oxides visible against the brown paint matrix in the photomicrograph at the right. By contrast, none of the works on paper within this study have a single continuous oil ground layer. Although the papers were toned or tinted by artists to a reddish brown color prior to execution of the painting. The decision to color this paper, color paper this tone is quite unsurprising, given that most paintings by the Karachi in general, but also within this study, have similar reddish brown tonality. One such example is this head of an old man, which you see on the right, with its reddish brown preparatory layer brushed across the surface. A similar layer was also visible in the head of a bishop, which you see here at the left, but here the coloured layer has also seeped into the depth of the paper, due probably to the failure of the size layer. In this case, the artist has applied an uneven and streaky lead containing priming. This looks very similar to the streaky grounds used by many artists working contemporaneously in Northern Europe, including Rubens. While the function of Rubens' Modelli, that we see here, is slightly different to that of this work, their technical similarity is striking. Given that this work was likely executed during the 17th century, placing it later in my date range, this preparation could be viewed as evidence of later eclectic tendencies in artists working one or two generations after the Karachi, who chose to incorporate aspects of Northern European practice into their style. Somewhat surprisingly, given the strong tradition of drawing in the wider creative context of these sketches, no evidence of underdrawing in any dry media has been found among the group. There are lots of fluid outlines painted in umber, but these are the only preliminary indications. Similar to the ground layers already discussed, cheap and locally sourced materials abound in the paint layers of these oil sketches. The palettes are mostly iron oxide earth-based pigments, probably locally sourced ochres, umbers, and red oxides, with lead white highlights, some sparing use of red lakes in the flesh and in occasional drapery, and blacks, which are mostly carbon-based. This remains the case even in the most sort of drawn painting of the group studied, which is the head of a man in profile to the left. This was executed in a tritone palette of umbers, quite reminiscent of Grisaille. So having taken you through a very, very quick overview of the materials and techniques of these sketches, I'll now turn to a discussion of their collection and display. This is going to focus heavily on the three works you see on slide here. These are all on paper, and this focus is due in part to the extra interventions, usually structural, that were required for these sketches to be displayed in their eventual contexts. So the Karachi traveled a lot in Italy. Agostino and Annie Ville spent time in Rome and various assistants also traveled very widely. Documentary evidence indicates that the Karachi circle did bring works with them when they traveled or moved. We know that Domenichino took his personal portfolio to Naples. Paper's relative portability and its lightweight relative to the stretched canvas or panel is further enhanced by the lack of evidence for the creators of these oil sketches undertaking any structural treatment within their own lifetimes. These, their sketches came directly from the life school straight into their portfolios. And here they became part of the visual repertoire with, used within studio, illustrating complex emotions, key character tropes, favored as aspects of brushwork or difficult perspectives or compositions. No evidence exists to demonstrate that or even how original creators might have displayed their own sketches. Evidence for, for this begins with the generations of artists, the assistance of the original creators and then their assistants who would inherit these portfolios. The precedent for works on paper by the Karachi in their circle to be mounted to a secondary support is set during the 17th century. With these works, Anibale and Agostino's ceiling cartoons for the Palazzo Farnese, which is in Rome. These were mounted on canvas, which you can see on screen, 
to protect the fragile paper and also to enable its display. The act of displaying pieces used in the service of larger works like these establishes the 17th century value of process pieces, illuminating the mental and physical process of a greatly admired earlier artist or artists. The fragility of works on art on paper must also be viewed as a key reason for this structural intervention. The collection left by Domenichino to his assistant sheds even more light on the process of artworks, leaving the portfolio and ascending the wall. Domenichino lived and worked in several Italian cities, including his hometown of Bologna, as well as Rome, Fano, and finally Naples. His principal assistant, a man called Francesco Raspatino, inherited the majority of his studio contents upon Domenichino's death in 1641. This included materials, drawings, cartoons, and some paintings. And the inventory refers to a group of these works, specifically as disegni ad olio, drawings in oil, which may have included the three studies of the head discussed earlier. Domenichino's bequest also included Annibale Caracci's so-called Urbino cartoon, which was made in preparation for a work in the Palazzo Farnese. This was itself passed from, from the Caracci to his assistant. And this cartoon was later acquired from Raspatino by yet another artist, Carlo Moratti, who we know hung it in his studio in Rome. It still retains a 17th century lining canvas, indicating that it was mounted for display by one of these owners, most likely Raspatino or Moratti. So hopefully having given you some context, I'm now going to focus on case studies for later collection. These three oil sketches that you see here were all collected by British travelers or by their agents in Italy during the 18th century. The work in the center is included despite its lately sta likely status as a copy. This is because at the time it was collected as a 17th century sketch. The reality of its possible later creation is therefore immaterial to the purposes it was collected to fulfill and would have been immaterial to how it was treated as well. The acquisition of Bolognese oil sketches by British collectors from the early 18th century onwards cannot be separated from the concurrent emergence of the Grand Tour phenomenon, particularly travel to Italy. Continental travel among the landowning classes was at least partly provoked by a renewed interest in classicism. This manifested in scholarly, artistic, and architectural output. So the shift away from the panelled interior that we see typically in Tudor or Stuart era architecture towards a more neoclassical conception of space is demonstrated beautifully by two of the buildings that house sketches I studied. Stourhead, which you see on screen, and Saltrum, which is now are both now National Trust properties, were extensively remodeled along classical lines during the late 18th century. And these neoclassical interiors enabled the display of art. A purpose-built picture gallery or a similar display case became a common feature of homes built or remodeled during this period. Whether such spaces were designed to accommodate existing or recently expanded collections, or the creation of the space itself would prompt collecting, it cannot be denied acquiring and also displaying art was a major interest among many returning from a grand tour, particularly those with architectural ambition at home. The individual profile of grand tour participants may also be related to their collecting habits. The souvenir artworks appeal lay not only in its function as a repository of travel memories, but also in its ability to illuminate the interests, tastes and talents of the person who collected it. At least two generations of Stourhead's owners, Henry Hoare II and his grandson, Richard Colthor, pictured here, who built the picture gallery in its library. The library is like a mirror image of the picture gallery. Um, both undertook tours to Italy, collecting artwork as they traveled. And we have records of customs expenses for importing pictures from Henry's 1739 tour. It's not possible to establish if that includes one of the works studied here, but it's likely. The painted sketch was not merely a fashionable decorative item, but for the amateur artist, it also functioned as instructive, much as the sketches and cartoons inherited by artist owners of the preceding 17th century were didactic in nature. Collectors such as the Hall family drew and painted themselves, often quite proficiently, and many encountered artists on their travels abroad, as these likewise undertook the European tours to further or finish an academic training. Much as the Karachi and their circle absorbed influence from the various Italian schools, 
the British Grand Tourist was expected to learn from the works of old masters, as well as the greats of classical antiquity. Continental travel for work, as well as leisure, could also provide an opportunity to collect, as the activities of the man on the right, General John Guides, demonstrate. A soldier with strong interest in the arts, who travelled extensively across Europe, Guise collected the majority of his art in Rome, Florence and Paris, and displayed work at his London home, before eventually bequeathing 257 paintings to his former college, Christchurch, Oxford, during his 1760 will. His collection is notably strong in Italian old masters and in copies of these, and his penchant for the Karachi is well represented in the collection to this day. Pragmatism was also somewhat at play in 18th century collection. The portable nature of oil on paper, which had ensured its preservation by artist creators in the portfolio-based collections of the previous century, was likewise attractive to the British traveller who temporarily inhabited an itinerant lifestyle very similar to these artistic predecessors. The 18th century desire to emulate these earlier artistic models, which I would argue is reinforced by the training of artists in academic institutions modelled on that of the Karachi, made collecting sketches very appealing. And for the amateur gentleman artist, the simplicity of technique that we see in these sketches and their resulting immediacy and vivacity would resonate. The attraction of being sort of close to the hand of the artist, which is quite a slippery concept, but a very important one, shouldn't be underestimated. This also stems from the 17th century in a tradition recognizing the sketch as a pensiero or the direct transmission of a mental process to the page or to the canvas. The relative affordability of paper oil sketches relative to larger easel paintings also shouldn't be ignored. Many of those undertaking a grand tour were young and were therefore yet to come into their inheritance. A final contributing factor to the collection of Bolognese oil sketches by British owners also deserves attention. These sketches are generally close cropped compositions of heads. And I'd argue that this relative lack of wider context means that they're devoid of much of the Catholic imagery of larger Karachi circle works. Indeed, head of a bishop that you see on the left is a rare, in fact, the only example I've ever seen of a character in an explicitly religious costume. The revelatory expression of these sitters is intended as pious, but it was equally applicable to the humanist sensibilities of the 18th and 19th centuries. The appeal of this neutrality shouldn't be underestimated, particularly as the 18th century progressed and public denigration of overt Catholicism increased in the UK, including in circles interested in art, architecture and antiquities. Anyone familiar with this history of the Society of Antiquaries will be able to tell you that. A Protestant collector of such a head study wouldn't have been constantly reminded of the Catholic origins of the work. And I think that this facilitated its display in an environment that was at worst hostile and at best ambivalent to its original realm of creation. So having examined some facets of the appeal of these to British collectors, we now must turn to the treatment of these oil sketches once they were brought to their ultimate locations. The allure of these artworks lay partly in their sense of immediacy, but this was partly reduced once they were amalgamated into collections. These works became, as did the buildings in which they hung, forms of social currency. A neoclassicism rise as the dominant tendency in British architecture had facilitated this new display style. Current displays at both Stourhead and Saltrim, which you see on screen here, imitate this mode of display. And again, as you see here, they imitate as far as possible an 18th century hang. Conforming to this display aesthetic meant that the oil sketch had to undergo a process of elevation from a process piece to something more congruent with a completed painting of a higher level of finish. Conservation interventions enabled these works to sit on the walls adjacent to more highly finished work, often by Italian old masters, including the Caracci, as Geyser's collection shows. But these oil sketches were also displayed alongside contemporary British painting which itself was a product of an academic tradition that was heavily influenced by the sketch's origin. This is extremely prevalent at Saltram. Um, the collection has a huge number of paintings by Reynolds, an artist and theorist who was very vocal in his admiration of the Karachi. And this synergy between older works from a locale visited by the artists and patrons of the contemporary work shown alongside was only really possible through a renegotiation of the sketch's function by means of its physical treatment. Finally, the painted sketch would be liberated from the portfolio where its drawn equivalent remained to find its final destination of the gallery wall. <laughs> 
mounting these sketches to a canvas or panel and then framing them is the most common means by which these undergo an elevation. Mounting and also enhanced their status, separated it from drawing, which usually remained as a loose sheet, and increased the monetary value for sale. This is an important thing to consider when looking at head of a bearded old man on the left. All three works examined here were mounted with two lined canvas and one marouflage to panel. Both of these sketches on Scolide are lined to medium to fine tabby weave canvas. The lining canvases are different. Um, one is 19th or early 20th century, um, while the canvas for head of a bishop, which you see on the left, is convincingly 18th century, although its stretcher has been made from two different varieties of splitting and wind damaged wood. I would theorise here that this work was probably lined and stretched in Wiltshire near Stourhead, probably by a non-specialist after its return from Italy. So this work, Christchurch Picture Gallery's Head of a Man in Profile to the Left, is marouflaged to a lightweight fruitwood panel of slightly larger dimensions than the paper. It's been quite roughly prepared. You can see the tool marks and it also has woodworm damage. While I wasn't able to carry out dendrochronology, the likely date of this marouflage is about 1670, oh, sorry, 1770 to 1773, when the college hired the restorer, John Bonus, to treat General Guise's recent bequest. The presence of another oil sketch on paper within the collection, which is mounted identically, also supports this interpretation. Varnishing these works brought the entire surface to a similar aesthetic level to the other paintings that were displayed alongside. There's no evidence for how or if 17th century uh, Bolognese artists varnished, but I think given the darker tonality and also the highly absorbent paper supports of most of these works, the sensible hypothesis is that most at least had a local varnish. Cross sections now show multiple natural resin varnishes with dirt interlayers indicating many later interventions. Lack of documentation regarding individual conservation history makes dating these quite difficult, but the varnish that can be most securely dated is that of the Christchurch work. Again, the similarly mounted oil sketch on paper in the collection has a near identical tinted brown varnish, probably again dating to the 1770s campaign of restoration. None of these works bear any evidence of retouching prior to 1800. What little is present is localized to damages and also sits above varnish, indicating that it's more modern in origin. Cropping and framing appears to have been the favoured means of elevating these works and disguising such damage or a lack of finish. All of these sketches have been cut down partially or wholly, and some have paper tape disguising the rougher edges. The top left edge of Head of a Bishop has a very jagged line. I'm sure we've all opened an envelope and made a similar situation occur. This can be viewed as evidence either of a restorer's lack of skill or ultimately of the intention to frame disguising damage and concluding the elevation to the gallery wall. Through the three case studies I've just discussed, as well as the wider group, it's possible to trace changes in function, resultant display and approach to treatment over time, as these oil sketches moved from a didactic function in the original owner's portfolio towards their eventual endpoint in the late 18th century gallery display. These changes are manifested through structural intervention the process of mounting papers to canvas or panel supports, facilitating the work's transition from portfolio to gallery wall, and also from useful to decorative. The importance of the wider context in which these works were created, used, and ultimately collected, and the many parallels between the context of creation in the 17th century and the context of collection, usually in the 18th, illustrates why such didactic purposes were pieces were elevated in this way. While they're small in size and quite simple, both materially and in compositional scope, I believe that these sketches demonstrate change and consistency regarding trends in artistic organization. They also show the favor given to art's capacity for illuminating emotion. I think this transcends time, as well as the interest in artistic precedent shown across the 17th and the 18th centuries. Um, I'm sure you'll all be relieved that I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would really like to thank the people listed on slide for their support. Um, I look forward to any questions. Oops.
Hello. Hi, Claire. <laughs> really interesting talk. We have, I should have told you to put um, questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, we have one question. It says, could you share your manuscript? I didn't fully understand some parts of it. Oh. Um, we'll I'm sure if this that. person emails, I can, yeah, pass on um, the text if that would help. So, um, uh, what is the average size of the works? Um, the they're all size? pretty small. They're, the majority of them are kind of like A4 paper or smaller. Um, a few are slightly larger. So, for example, um, the three studies of the head of an old man, um, this is in the background that you see here, um, is larger. It's kind of around A3 size is probably the easiest comparison. Um, and the quartal portrait of a man, the one that also had an underlying composition, um, that again is slightly larger. But the majority of them are really quite small. Um, they're certainly not large scale pieces. And you said that they've been cut down. So you think they've been cut down from sort of A3 or trimmed from so, A4? So, yeah, some of, the work, some of the works on paper um, have been cut down. The canvases, um, there's sort of less evidence to support that. Although, you know, many of them have been lined and later restretched. So it's quite difficult to know exactly. Um, yeah, the works on paper, I think, probably didn't, weren't much larger initially, but I think the cutting down is usually due to, to be honest, damaged edges. Um, they're trying to raise the level of finish to make them more congruent with the rest of the displays that they're ending up in. Um, here's one from Emma Schumacher. Did you investigate how the paper was attached to the canvas? Um, yes, yeah, so most of the um, papers are lined. Um, it's usually a kind of a glue paste lining. Um, there was actually one instance in my study in which it was wax resin lined, um, which again, I think is quite interesting because it shows that whoever was doing this really thought of it as kind of a painting. Um, obviously we typically see wax resin linings associated with canvases. Um, so it's kind of interesting using a paper or like lining a paper in that way. Uh, I presume it must have darkened the paper. Yeah, I think it would have. Um, which again, you know, it's it's interesting how these changed over time. Um, the kind of the tinted varnish that I discussed very briefly in relation to one of the works is um, it's really brown, and um, you know, I think it says a, quite a lot about sort of aesthetics of the late 18th, early 19th century. There's obviously that whole thing about, you know, a good painting is brown like a violin. Um, I can never remember who that quote is attributed to, but it's that kind of aesthetic of old masterness that um, yes. they're really trying to associate these with. Um, on, um, from Yelena Zagora, on which mm -hmm. basis have you dated one of the lining canvases to 18th century? I she says she didn't catch it. Um, it was largely due to examination and comparison with known canvases of a similar date. It's very difficult to date kind of lining interventions securely, but the lining is very old, um, slightly failing. And that in combination with the appearance of the canvas, I wasn't unfortunately able to take a canvas sample, um, which I would have liked to have because that also would have helped. Um, it's mostly down to visual analysis and comparison with kind of other known sources. I, I think I'm correct in uh, saying that there isn't a way of dating a canvas the way you can dendrochronologically date a panel. <laughs> yeah, I think not, not a straightforward way. I think you can, you know, you can do like isotope analysis and carbon date it, but I think that's very expensive and a bit beyond the scope of um, <laughs> most conservation budgets. Certainly beyond the scope of a, a third year project budget at the course um, um, How long do you think the average sketch would have taken to paint? They look really quite sort of spontaneous. And, yeah, yes, they so are. 
Um, really not long. Run across the room. Um, the sorry. Um, all of these pretty much are executed in a single sitting. Um, the one exception is probably the three studies where each of the heads is probably one sitting. Um, but yeah, all of these sketches are basically a kind of one hit wonder. Um, and I think that in itself is really interesting, um, given that within the context of kind of wider Karachi scholarship, one of the main problems is individual attribution, because the Karachi work on top of each other all the time. They're constantly sharing commissions, sharing things. One person might do a drawing that then appears in another person's painting. It's sort of constant reworking and working and going on top of each other. And that's why I kind of really wanted to look at these sketches because they are just by one hand. Um, you know, even to the extent where bare, there's barely any retouching across most of them. So even from a conservation perspective, they still remain very much the original hand. Um, and yeah, I think that's quite interesting in a context where we see, particularly in the drawn context, there are sheets where we have, you know, a drawing attributed to pretty much each one of the Karachi. Um, you know, the two brothers and the cousin, as well as students working on them as well. So it is quite interesting that they're done very quickly. I mean, some of them, I think, probably would have been the work of minutes, others maybe a couple of hours, but really not longer than that. OK, um, a question from Paige Strobel. Um, so were these pieces kept in the artist studios as working archive and then at a later date sold off? I think that's what you said. Yeah. Oh, hang on, this is only half the question. <laughs> How many do you think were generated over a working year in the studio? And was there always an eye to a commercial release? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so yes, they were kept in studio as a kind of work, sort of basically source material to work from. Um, I suppose the way I conceptualize it is, you know, Anibale Karachi to Guachino or Domenichino might be like, oh, I've done a study of, you know, this old man that would be perfect for this saint, you know, go and have a look at it and make your own and they generate. Um, in terms of how many they would have produced, I mean, I shared the quote on screen of the um, contemporary source saying that they they drew all the time. Um, you know, they had charcoal in one hand and bread in the other. Let's hope they never mix them up. But um, I, I think that the kind of their process was really just to generate constantly. Um, it's also partly, I think, why they're reusing you know, account books, ledgers, shopping lists, whatever comes to hand, they're gonna draw on it or paint on it. Um, in terms of their commercial, whether they were made with an eye to future sale, I think probably not. I think the, um, the fact that lots of them were destroyed pretty much at the point of creation um, demonstrates that they weren't thought of as necessarily important. Um, Gail Feigenbaum has written some really, I think she's a really great source on this because she's written, I think the title of one of her articles is from the fire, frying, or out of the frying pan and into the fire, um, meaning that they would scrub their frying pan with a sheet of paper, draw on it, and then discard it in the fireplace. Um, obviously the painted sketch is a little bit different, but I think these were really intended to be kept and not to be sold. The question of inheritance is another matter because these obviously were inherited by later artists. Um, There's a more yeah. reference, sort of kept as reference material. Yeah, and, and then, then handed on as reference material. And then, you know, eventually you hit a point where suddenly there's a market for these and, you know, Carlo Moratti thinks, yeah, I'll sell this. Um, to an 18th century grand tourist who sees it hanging in his studio. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, one more, uh, Catherine Lowry again. Anibal, Anibal Karachi's head of a man in profile has a very different color range 
to the other works shown mm -hmm. is this unusual yeah so that's why that work is included in my kind of initial grouping um that one is I think really intended more as a portrait um I think it's an informal portrait there have been suggestions that it could be a self-portrait or even a portrait of a member of the studio um the background obviously it has that greenish tonality um it's not totally unusual in the context but yeah that work is more colorful and I think that is probably due to the fact that it's intended as a specific likeness um rather than one of these more general trony type figures um yeah I hope that answers it oh really interesting I um I dealt with um such a, a, a head mm -hmm. I, I should send you the photograph of it we'd love to see <laughs> uh, well you may not because uh, some packers had walloped something really oh. not much through it it was tiny oh no <laughs> yes um I'll, yeah. uh, I'll dig out what I've got and say yes mm -hmm. send it to you um Okay, I think we we don't have any uh, questions in the chat, do we? Um, I don't, um, don't think there are any more. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think there are any more. Um, so I think that's it. All that remains with me today is thank you, a huge thank you. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. Um, Thanks, Ella. I, I will be in touch. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy for people to be like, if anyone wants my email to ask about the questions, they're very welcome to. Yeah, well, I think they've all got mine and I can send them on. Perfect. But yeah, we have the applause. <laughs> Let's <not> the <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, goodbye. Good night. Splendid.